Let me introduce myself. My name is Aryeh Frimer, a rabbi, professor Aryeh Frimer, just like Rabbi, Ziv rabbi Zivitovsky's rabbi doctor. Um, the idea of having both rabbis and professors or doctors at Bar Ilan is very, very common. It really is a combination of Torah and Mada. That's one of the things that we're very proud of. Um, the subject that I would like to present before you today is, as you can see in Hebrew, it's called Leket Tovenot Madaiyot Torah, which means scientific insights into the Torah. And what I'd uh, like to begin with is a statement from uh, Shlomo Melech, the wisest of all men, who said, <coughs> I apologize for my cold and cough, who said, Bechol Drachecha Deeu, which means, through all your endeavors, become aware of them. And what I'd like to present to you is something that's very, very personal. It's how I, with the scientific training, go through the Torah and think that I understand the Excellent. Thank you. I uh, think that I understand the Torah perhaps with greater profundity than others because of my scientific training. Um, and again, this is very personal. It's, uh, I've spoken about this many, many times. There are issues that you can agree with me or disagree with me, but I think you'll find it interesting. <coughs> This lecture is going to be very different than perhaps other lectures you've heard about science and religion. There's going to be no de detailed discussion of creation, although we will talk about it a little bit. Uh, we're not going to talk about the age of the universe or the Big Bang or the differentiation of species. We're not going to talk about uh, the Mabul or, for instance, why kangaroos and polar bears got from Hararat only to Australia and no place else. How do they get there at all? And how come they got only there? These are interesting questions. They're not the topic of my talk. Um, there will be no discussion of the reliability of the authority of Chazal when it comes to scientific based material, let alone the question of what's called Nishtana Teva, perhaps the laws of nature have changed. The topics we're going to talk about are those that piqued my curiosity as a, a scientist and as a rabbi, and I think that you'll find, the, find, find it informative. The basic premise of this lecture is that the Torah is not a book of science. It's not there to come teach us, certainly Bracious has not come to teach us the laws of nature or the mechanisms of life. It's not scientifically detailed, <coughs> but as a work that we believe was composed by God, it has to be scientifically accurate. Uh, it, it describes the creation of the world in very broad brushstrokes, and it attempts to outline in words that have to be timeless and uh, uh, applicable and coherent through all generations, some very complicated scientific processes. And therefore, the Torah has to choose its words well. And I want you to understand that the words can't be taken literally. As you'll, as you'll see, the Torah is trying to use a word that will be understandable for thousands of years at different stages of scientific de development. You take the words of the Torah seriously, but not literally, as you'll see as we go through it. I've always been very astounded how we teach Breshit to first graders when you're six years old. I simply don't understand it. It's probably the most complex of all the books of Tanakh, conceptually, scientifically, and I have to thank here a Rebbe of mine that I had in high school when I learned, essentially learned Breshit for the third time, and he sensitized me to, his name is Rabbi Yaakov Dardak Zal, who sensitized me to many of the issues that I'm going to talk with you today. Now, on your sheets we have several sources, but the, I'm going to begin with some of the first psukim and which I'm sure you're acquainted with, 
which you know by heart. So let's begin with the first Pasuk. Breshit bara elokim et hashamayim ve'et ha'aretz. Okay, in the beginning of God's creation of the heavens and the earth, that Breshit bra is how the, most of the Forshim understand it, in the beginning of God's creation of the heavens and the earth, etc. What's the most important word there? Beginning, Breshit is the most important word in that sentence. So there was a beginning. So what was the first thing that God created? Time. If I say in the beginning, we're talking about time. Time is now going to begin to elapse. So the first thing that God created is time. Now as scientists, we know that time is, is one of the dimensions, like any other dimension, and time can be longer or shorter. I mean, that's part of the, the dilation of time that Einstein, he got, he got uh, a Nobel Prize for that, that discovery, that time changes with the speed that you're traveling at. Now that's pretty mind-boggling, but then it was created by God, so why would you think it would be simple or simplistic? Okay, so let's now move on to the second verse. V'ha'aretz hayta tov avo, v'choshech al p'nei tahom, v'ruach elokim merachefet al p'nei amayim. And the world was comprised of tov avo, and darkness was on the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the water, I don't understand one word. I simply don't understand it. Huh? I don't understand what tovo means. I don't understand choshech. I don't understand tahom. Is there water there? So, God, where does the water come? I don't understand ruach elokim bechlalo and Amayim again. I, so there are a lot of things in this passage I simply don't understand. But so let me try to suggest ways of putting this together. <coughs> the Ramban, citing the Greek philosophers. The Greek philosophers were great scientists. They never did an experiment. Everything was what they called Gedanken experiments. They did everything by thinking. It was only until the 1700s people like Lavoisier and the like, who began to do experiments and measure things, make predictions and measure things. But the science, it's amazing what the Greeks were able to do. They were more philosophers than scientists. Anyway, the Greek philosophers, as cited by the Ramban, suggests a, a, a very unique concept. They suggest that tohu vavohu is mass without form. It's quite, quite ahead of the time. I mean, you see, whenever we see mass, thingness, we always, it always has form. What's this concept of mass without form? Now, anybody has learned physics, right? F equals ma. The concept mass in all of scientific equations makes no difference what the shape is. There's a, some inherent quality, thingness of, of an object that is called the mass. So, and simultaneous with the creation of matter, matter begins to decay and that uh, allows, us, allows the passage of time. Now my modern scientists agree with the priority of shapeless matter and suggest that this shapeless matter was composed of basic mar the basic particles of the universe. I'm not talking about protons, neutrons. I'm talking about b b beneath, beneath that. And they talk about what they call the primordial soup or primordial flux um, of elemental particles. And that seems to be what the word mayim is referring to, this primordial soup. But they took no three-dimensional form. Why? 
because there were no forces to pull them together. Think about what gives this chair, this chairness about it, or the table, the ta it's different forces that hold the molecules together. Those are forces, and that comes from energy. The energy of bonding, of molecules bonding together, that gives it its shape, its form, and many of its properties. <coughs> so what was lacking? We had thingness, we had mass. What are we missing? Energy. We're missing energy. God hadn't created energy yet. And it's energy that causes matter to attract, to repel. <coughs> it's energy that creates shape, things to stick together loosely or strongly. And this lack of energy is what we call choshech. The choshech, al penetaho, means there was no energy. So what's the next thing that God creates? He has tovavo, vayihi or. So God creates or. Now again, or can't mean light like we have outside. Why? When was that created? On the fourth day. We're still on the first day. So God is now creating basic, basic things that are needed for the rest of creation. Now Rashi struggles with this. Rashi on the, on the beginning says, what's this ore that God created on the first day? There's a famous joke they asked God, why did you create light the first thing? He says, what, you expected me to work in the dark? Yeah. The, the, the God, God creates energy. Light is what's called, is one of the forms of electromagnetic energy. It was a, it's a good word, because it's pretty close to what we mean. They didn't have the word energia, energy, in the Torah, but it's very good selection of a word if we want to talk about energy. We're talking about light energy. So the next thing that we have <coughs> is Vayar Elokim et ha'or kitov, Vayabdel Elokim ben ha'or uvein ha'choshech. And God saw that light was good. What does that mean, that light is good? It means that it is a desired, fundamental controlling process. It's good for the rest of creation. And because it's energy that drives and controls all chemical, all biological and physical processes. So now we have mass, and now we have energy. We can go to work. Now the creation story proceeds from here with God setting up the laws of matter and the laws. Yes? One, one question, why can't, it, why can't it actually be talking about light when it says light? Why do we think it's not talking about light? Because there's no sun. Sun wasn't created the fourth day. The sun is not the source of light. What about luminous nebulae? You have to create. It doesn't. We're talking about Earth. We're talking about Earth. So my suggestion, you can suggest other things, but the thing that to me makes the most sense is God created mass, and then He creates energy, and then He begins with the rest of the creative process. Yes. When you say that mass has no form, does that mean that there's no volume to it? It has a fluctional volume. It's no fixed shape. It's like a, it's like it's very much like a liquid in that it's that's why they call it the primordial soup. Because it has no given uh, has no given forces. And when you say that God first created mass and then energy, you are assuming that these are two distinct properties of matter. Oh yes, scientifically they clearly are. Energy is not a property of, well, it can be. It has kinetic energy, but it's something, the, the mass can, a mass can have no energy, be sitting around doing nothing. Okay, now, you have to uh, appreciate that it says, it says, Vayar Elokim et ha'or kitov, Vayavdel Elokim ben ha'or uven ha'choshech. God divides between light and darkness. I want you to appreciate that that is not a trivial statement. How do you understand God dividing light from darkness? The answer is that light, when I set up rules to light, vayabdel means God is setting up rules, 
and he's making up rules for light and darkness, you have to understand there are two types of darkness. There's the darkness that is the absence of energy. That's the darkness that we had at the very beginning of creation. But there's another type of darkness. If you have two coherent waves which undergo destructive interference, if you learn a little physics you understand the two waves just overlap so that the amplitude is zero. You can have, and this is something you can show on the wall, you have shown it when I teach your uh, basic uh, first year chemistry course, you can have a situation where you have light, dark, light, dark, light, dark, light, dark, because the waves are coherent waves, the same way with the same amp, but the, this one has the maximum where the other wave ever overlaps with that at the minimum, so that together they have a, a wave amplitude of zero, and therefore since the amplitude is zero, you have darkness. It's, it's pretty mind-blowing to see these things, but that's true. You can have a light wave, you can have darkness because there's no light wave at all. There's no energy. You can have it because there is a light wave or two light waves, but they overlap such there's destructive interference and therefore you have no, the amplitude is zero, there's no amplitude of the energy. Okay, it can be no energy and an energy with a wave of an amplitude of zero. Okay, and they're different things and have different, because there's light, to the, there's energy to the right of me and energy to the left of me, but where I am, there's no energy. Very strange. So you, that's, that's getting pretty profound, but there are two types of darkness. Actually, there's a third darkness in the Torah, that's the Makat Choshech, it says Vayamesh Choshech, we don't know what that is. Okay, let's move on to the, look at now source number one. What does it mean Vayavdal in that? He set up rules. He, there are now, that light now has wave particle. In fact, there's wave particle duality. I don't want to go into that. You have to learn a lot more physics and chemistry to understand that. But light has certain rules to it which affect how it interacts with You're matter. You're saying that on that <coughs> the rules of all... God set up the rules. That's, that's what Vayavdal means. Not just the wave particle duality of light, it's the... It's the rules of light, right, the rules of light, the, the rules of light. Well, I mean, that's energy. I'm talking about energy. Okay. Yeah? But I thought that light wasn't created yet, so how can you... I didn't say that. I said the sun wasn't created yet. I said energy, energy was created. Okay. Energy was created. The kind of light is merely one form of energy. There's chemical energy, there is uh, electrical energy. That, I'm talking about something so very forms abstract. Of energy were energy, the, and forms of energy were created, that is correct. Yes? Because Khan said the, um, back on the primordial suit, is there any scientific evidence of. Okay. Yeah, yeah, is there any proof? I, uh, the answer is, I'm not, a co I'm not a cosmologist, so I can't answer that question. I know that, that scientists who are cosmologists talk about this at a great length. After the Big, after the big Bang, right after the Big Bang, this uh, primordial soup is being formed and it moves into, it moves into, uh, into green. He says, is there any evidence for the primordial soup? The answer is I don't know. Okay. Let's now, let's now move to source number one, okay? <coughs> let's, we'll leave creation. Let's now move to the fourth day. Vayas elukim et shnei ha-maorot ha-gdolim. Et ha-maor ha-gadol. Right? Et ha-maor ha-gadol l-memshelet ha-yom. Et ha-maor ha-katan l-memshelet ha-layla. Right? So God made the two large lights, the great light to rule the day and the small light to rule at night. And look at Rashi there. Rashi says, Shavim nivru'u. They were created equal, because it says the two great lights. Okay? When you read this in first grade, it's, it's okay. But you guys are much more mature now. 
Is this all Chazal have to struggle about? I mean, seriously. What, what, is, what are Chazal attempting to teach us? First of all, what's the problem? The problem is that the text says there are two, two great lights. And all of a sudden, we have a great light and a small light. What happened to two great lights? So Rashi, so Chazal answer. Now, Chazal have a problem. Answers can be of different forms. One is, what's the pshat? Sometimes Chazal's answers are educational, moral lessons. They don't know what pshat is, but they learn from the text an educational message. I don't think Chazal are struggling here with the pshat. I'll, I'll deal with pshat. I think Chazal is trying to teach us a moral lesson. And the moral lesson is, and as you get older, you'll understand how true this is, how wise Chazal were. There are situations in life which are not ideal situations. But if you touch the situation, it just gets worse. <coughs> and therefore, you learn to live with it. You have, you have two great shtema orot gedolim. Right? And the Levana comes and says, you know, it's not right. Somebody's got to be boss. You want it to work fun properly? Somebody's got to be boss. Kodesh Baruch Hu says, yeah, this is not a good idea. She insists. Some ancient name Elohim. Can't have two kings ruling with the same crown. God says, okay, I'm going to make you smaller. It's certainly not the outcome she expected. She's made the situation, from her perspective, substantially worse. That's the lesson Chazal want to teach us. That in life, sometimes we don't have an ideal situation, but anything that we change will make it worse. But what's pshat? What's pshat in the Pasuk? I'll give you two possible suggestions. One suggestion is that the moon and the sun are visually, that when I look up into the sky, the moon and the sun are exactly the same size. How do I know that? Eclipses. What? Eclipses. Eclipses. When you have an eclipse of the moon on top of the sun, it covers it exactly. Now it's true, there are flares that come out from the side. There are flares on the sun all the time. You really don't see them unless there's an eclipse and you're careful how you look at it. But it covers it exactly. So from the optical, when I look, it's an optical illusion, they're really the sun and the moon. Comes along the Torah and says, but don't be fooled. One of them is bigger than the other. Which one is the bigger one? The sun, which rules during the day. And the smaller one is the moon. But visually, you look at them, they're the same size. The other possibility is that Gadol and Katan in the second verse refer to intensity of the light. And the Mora Gadol means the intense light is for the day, and the less intense light is at night. <coughs> Let me just give you a, a very nice vort. A, a drusha from Rav Salavechik, which is a, a very, very nice. I'm, I give Devar Torah a great deal. And every person needs a Devar Torah in his hip pocket. If you should get called up for a, a bris or something, you need some Devar Torah that you didn't prepare, you can whip it out. It's very important. I don't go to any simcha unprepared. Because they always call on me. Why do they always call on me? Because I'm always prepared. <laughs> so the chicken and egg problem. Anyway, this is a beautiful vort from Salavechik. In the bris we say, Zekatan Gadolier. Asks Rav Salavechik, asks Rav Salavechik, what is, where do we find Katan and Gadol? Says Rav Salavechik, we find it by the Moor Gadol and Moor Katan. What's the difference? The Moor Gadol creates its own light. The Moor Katan really reflects light. So he says, that's what we're wishing the parents. Zekatan, this little kid, 
So he's a katan because all he can do right now maximally for the next few years of his life is reflect what he learns from his parents. Zach, katan, kedolia. Our prayer is that he should be a, a son where he creates his own light and shining on other people. A very nice idea. Okay, let's move on to the next source. The next source is uh, source number two. Okay? Vayomer Elokim Yishritsu Hamayim Nefesh Chaya. That the water should teem with living life, with fish. Vayitzer Hashem, in the next verse, Vayitzer Hashem Elokim et Adam, Vayipach Ba'apav Nishmat Chayim, and he breathed into man. Nishmat Chayim, let's say the breath of light, life. Vihi Adam Nefesh I became a living being. Okay, so let's, I would like to bring to your attention that these two verses talk about, uh, they speak about life teeming in the water and also the fact that life is sustained by the breath of life or oxygen. And you have to understand, appreciate, that these two things, water and oxygen, which all of life is based on, are anomalous. They're exceptional. They each have exceptional properties, which allows them, it's, what, it's those, these anomalous properties that allow them to function the way they are. What's the anomalous property of water? The proper, anomalous property of water is that First of all, it's a great solvent, but that's not another. That when it freezes, it becomes less dense. That is, ice actually floats on water. It's less dense than water. This is very strange, because generally speaking, when something becomes a solid, it becomes more compacted. For those of you who have certain chemistry background, the answer, the reason for it is that when you go in the liquid, the major form of interaction, and there are two forms of interaction. One is that lines up with what are called dipole-dipole interactions, and the, the water, which is like a V, lines up in Vs, and that's a closer packing. <laughs> Another form of interaction is this type of interaction, which is, which is hydrogen bonding. As you get colder, the hydrogen bonding takes over. Hydrogen bonding is very, very good, particularly in oxygen, but it's less dense. Instead of being packed like this, one, one, like one cone on the other, it's like this, which is, which is not the best form of packing, therefore it's less dense. So, did you want to ask something? Okay, so, so that's why it happens, but as a result, aquatic life can function. Let's think about it. Oxy water, when it freezes, what happens to it? It rises to the top. Water is an insulator. It prevents the cold from being transmitted. So you can transmit it to the water that is above the water and the Arctic Ocean. Okay, the water, the water on top is frozen and at the temperature it can be minus 40 degrees, minus 50, it can be very, very cold. I'm talking about 50 degrees centigrade. So okay, it's very, very cold. And what's the temperature of where the fish are below? Zero. Zero degrees, maybe if there's, it's salty, so it's minus 10 degrees. It's not minus 40. There's fish underneath the water. Why? How come the water is only? Because the ice on top insulates the fish, the water, from getting any colder. And as a liquid, it stays at zero degrees. And you can also imagine if, if the water was more dense, if the ice were more dense than the water, these enormous blocks would sink to the bottom, killing all the fish. So when, a, when God came along and said, creating water and it should teem with life, it's saying something about how water functions. That water has to have special properties to allow the fish to teem. Otherwise, they would simply die. Okay, let's talk about oxygen. Oxygen is what they call a diatomic molecule, it naturally appears as O2. And without going into 
the necessary quantum mechanics, uh, all, the, all the discussion. Um, you may know that oxygen has 16 pairs of electrons. It's very, very unique in the fact that most of life, actually like people, usually people come as pairs, male, female. Electrons come up, down. However, oxygen for quantum mechanical reasons, 14 of the electrons are paired. Two of the electrons, which are the highest and the highest anti-bonding orbital, just being a name dropper, looks like this. Electron in each orbit, two orbitals of the same energy. So oxygen is what's called a biradical, has two electrons that don't pair. And this changes its properties tremendously. It's, its reaction with other species which have pairs of electrons is spin forbidden. Which means it can't simply react with other pairs of electrons because it's got to find a match and it doesn't have a match. Uh, so I, I hope you understand why this is important. See, we walk around, we swim in 20% oxygen. Rea reactions with oxygen are highly, highly exothermic. They're very favorable. Very, very favorable. So why don't we just burn up? How come oxidation processes go very slowly? We need oxygen to live. We have to talk about how the body is going to use oxygen. We'll talk about that in a second. But we don't simply burn up. Why don't we? Because there's spin forbiddenness. Because the oxygen is this way and everything else it wants to react with is this way, as a pair. So what's the trick? How do I get it to react? The answer is when you want it to react, you have to make sure that the species it reacts with only has one electron. And then for, therefore, when you have two electrons, this electron reacts with a species like this, and this electron reacts with a species like this, two-step processes. Reacts very different. Oxygen chemistry is very different than everything else. Now, I want you to understand that biological processes which depend on oxygen generally have enzymes, metals. Metals are great at receiving one electron or giving one electron. They all have manganese or iron or copper. That's the trick. Because I can take a set of electrons and one of the electrons gets a transferred to the metal in the center of the, uh, center of the enzyme. I'm left with one electron and oxygen then can combine very, very quickly with it. So God creates oxygen with very unique anomalous properties. If you know the trick, you can get, the, and the body knows the trick, it can do the oxidation process that are necessary in a very controlled fashion. One example of, of an uncontrolled is a forest fire. Now what happens when I strike a match? There's tremendous heat when I strike that. It has to do with the phosphorus at the tip of the match. We'll talk about that some other time. I start the fire. The fire has tremendous heat. And when I start lighting things, it breaks bonds, okay, which have two electrons. And it causes them to break because of the high heat. And then I get these radical single electrons. And then it starts taking off because these are very energetic processes. It gives off tremendous heat and it just keeps burning and burning and burning and as long as it has fuel it just keeps breaking the bonds and the, the, ox, the fire takes care of itself. So the message is that oxygen and, and uh, water about which life are based are anomalous and Nakodesh Baruch made him that way so that life could function properly and safely. Let's now go back to that Second source three, and I just want to make one further point. Okay, I want you to appreciate that um, we, it's, according to the different Rishonim have a discussion of what is Nishmat Chayim. Some say from the word Nishama, 
some spiritual qualities. Other Rishonim say it comes from the word nishima, meaning respiration. And what's very interesting is that nishima, man is called <laughs> vayal nefesh chaya. And it was only much, much later in the 1700s that we began to learn that blood transports the oxygen. That oxygen is the breath of life. And what transports it to parts of the body? It's the blood. And the blood is also called what? Ki adam hu ha nefesh. The Torah describes it exactly. Calls man a nefesh chaya because of the nishmat chayim. The blood is called ki adam hu ha nefesh. But man couldn't understand that until the 1700s. I just want you to understand that life and death all depend on oxygen. Much of life and death depend on oxygen. It's called the life-death nexus by Erwin Friedrich of Duke University. Let's see <coughs> what happens as I breathe oxygen. I breathe in oxygen. It gets an electron, forms superoxide anion radical. It then forms hydrogen peroxide. And then in the presence of metals, it can decompose to hydroxy radical. Hydroxy radical is the source of over 130 diseases, including senility cancer, because this hydroxy radical is a real baddie. And, but the body has protective mechanisms. It has, for instance, to get rid of superoxide, there's superoxide dismutase. To get rid of hydrogen peroxide, we have catalase. But if the body doesn't get rid of them, and superoxide and hydrogen peroxide get together in the presence of iron, you get hydroxy radical, and that will cause senility, death, accumulation of damage that we call aging, the aging process. When HaKadosh Baruch wanted to bring death into the world, he didn't have to work very hard. All he had to do was take these two enzymes, superoxide dismutase and catalase, which were perhaps working 100% effective, make him work only 98% effective, then the hydroxyl radical would accumulate and cause death in 120 years, accumulation of damage. Because hydroxyl radical is su such a baddie, it attacks RNA and DNA and the repair mechanisms of the body, and this damage accumulates and causes death. Okay. My time is running out, I have another 10 minutes. <coughs> So let's move quickly through a few more subjects. Uh, source number four. Okay, notice that the Torah in the creation of woman says that God took the side. Rib, you know, they, they say, what did Eve do every evening when Adam came home from work? She counted his ribs. Okay. <laughs> if I have to explain it, it's a little. Okay, so, so God takes one of the ribs, Vayiven. Vayiven. He builds. What does that mean, Vayiven? God's taking man and he's doing something with the material to create woman. There's a fundamental problem here. That is, as far as the chromosomes are concerned, men and women are different. I can understand that you take a man and make a man, and a woman and a woman. How do you take a man with his, uh, with his um, <coughs> chromosomes and make a woman out of it? <coughs> There's cloning going on here, very obviously. The answer is it's very simple. See, if you have XY, you can make XX. You have to clone properly, but you, get, you can make a woman with XX. But if you have XX, if you started with a woman, you couldn't make a man. That, I believe, is the reason why God made man first. Not because he's better, not because he's more beautiful. If you want to clone, that's how you got to do it. OK, next subject. Let's look at the rainbow problem. At Kashti, like we're talking God, God uh, brings the, God brings the, the, the Mabul, and, it's, and then at the end, God says, look up, you'll see this rainbow. At Kashti natati ba'anan vahita la'ot brit 
It'll be a covenant between me and the land, between me and the land, that I won't bring the flood again. Right on the spot, the Ramban says, I don't understand. You see, it says the Ramban, what do you mean that God created the Keshet? And that's now going to be the symbol between man and God. The Greeks already knew the laws of nature, right, which we talked about already. And the breaking of light, the fraction of light, creates the rainbow. That was there from six days of creation. So what does it mean? There had to have been rainbows before the flood. So the Ramban, you're not learning Pshat right. Pshat is as follows. The rainbow is always there. It's always been there since the six days, of, seven days of creation. From now on, it's going to be a mnemonic device. I'm telling you from now on, we're going to use that as a mnemonic device, as the symbol of the covenant that I won't bring another flood. That's how to learn shot, says the Ramban and of Sajagon. But not that God made the rainbow at that particular point. That can't be. Okay. I want to talk about something that's very fundamental the na to the nature of miracles. Okay, the Jews are wandering, are wandering through the desert right after Maman Har Sinai. Look at 6a Aleph. They came to Mara and they couldn't drink the water. Because they were non potable, they could not drink it. God, and Moshe called out to God and he showed him a tree. Vayishlach el hamayim. He threw it into the water. Vayim teku hamayim. The water became potable, became drinkable. Ladies and gentlemen, if I were God, what would I do? I would say, zap, you're drinkable. But it seems God doesn't work that way. I don't know if you've heard, ever heard of Bill Cosby. Bill Cosby was a, uh, was a very famous entertainer and comedian in the years that I was growing up, which is before you guys were a twinkle. And, and Bill Cosby has this series, and I warmly recommend you listen to it, called Noah. And Noah is there pushing up tuba pot, that's right, vuba vuba, right. He's pushing up tuba potamuses into the, into the, the ark. And uh, God says, Noah, you got to take one back. You have two females there. He said, Noah just blows the stack. He says, I've been trying to get these two bottles up into the ark. I've been working hours and hours and hours and hours to get them on the table, get them up. And now you tell me they're both females? You change one of them. And God says, Noah, I don't work that way. God doesn't work that way. God created the world with the laws of nature and, and miracles that violate the laws of nature are only invoked when absolutely necessary. This is the position of the Ralbag and the Rambam and the Ibn Ezra and, and many of the Jewish philosophers. God doesn't change the laws of nature unless absolutely necessary. So what does he do here when he has this non-drinkable water? He says, Moshe, take this tree and throw it in, and it's going to do, via osmosis, is going to take out all the undrinkable stuff and it's going to solve the problem. There was a big discussion about this in nature. Raoul Hoffman, Nobel Prize winner in chemistry, uh, makes a big to do about this that we should try to find out what this tree is. And one guy says, This is in nature, the leading journal in science. And somebody writes a letter to the editor, What do you mean, fine? It was a miracle. And what did Ronald Hoffman say? God doesn't work that way. I'll, I'll prove it to you. Okay, let's look at the look at Pasuk um, six, six bet, bet. The Jews are by the Red Sea, right? And uh, they're just about the, the Egyptians are behind them, and they want to go. They, they, the Red Sea is in front of them. And what does it say? Vayat Moshe yado alayam. Moshe put his hand. What happened? When Moshe stuck out his hand, what happened to the water? Well, what happened to the water? It split, right? No. Cease to be the mill blows it here. And if you've seen the Ten Commandments, he simply blows it. The Pasuk doesn't say that. See, God doesn't do miracles that way. 
Let's look at what, what the Pasuk says. Vayat Moshe et yado al hayam, vayolech Hashem et hayam beruach kadim aza kol halayla. He puts his hand on the river, the wind starts blowing. All night. All night. God could have done zap. Doesn't work that way. He blows the wind all night. Oh, and that, what? Uh, so what's the miracle? The miracle is in the timing, and I'll prove it to you. The miracle is in the timing. Uh, two scientists known as Drews and Han carried out a computer simulation about where they thought the, the, the crossing of the Red Sea was, and they, according to the computer sim simulation, if you blow the wind at 63 kilometers per hour all night, the water splits and it dries up and it stacks the water. <laughs> So what's the miracle? You're right. It's still a miracle. Says the Ralbag, the miracle is in the timing. That it happened just when it was needed. And if you want to understand something, I have no time. I have two minutes left. Um, if, uh, if you want to understand the uh, Paro's resistance to the ten plagues, how he keeps saying no, 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 the answer is because he keeps rationalizing it. My Khartoumim can do it, it's, it's feasible, it's, 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 a, it's a natural, it can be done naturally. Okay, let me uh, just sort of end with two things that I believe are, have the wow nature to it. So since we don't have time, let's look at, let's look at um, source number 12. Did you want to ask a question? Yes. Would you say then that divine intervention is generally restricted to situations of existential crises? Like You're asking me philosophical questions. I, existential, I don't know. I mean, I think there are objective crises. I don't think of it because think it's essentially... Like on a nationalistic level. What? Like on a nationalistic level. I, I think that the nature of most miracles are in the timing not in the essence of the miracle itself. That these miracles can be explained away naturally, but it happened just when it was needed. Okay, let's look now at, uh, very, very quickly, it's source number 12. I may steal, yes. Okay, so, um, just out of curiosity, is, I mean, is science able to, are scientists trying to explain every single miracle that seemed to happen in the Midbar? For example, scientists are trying to explain the falling from the sky, and when God tells. Oh well, we don't know what the man is yet, but they're attempting to. Yes, right. They're that attempting. Also has yeah, they talk about by uh, et kolot, right? They, I mean, by yiru et kolot. Okay, what is this seeing the sounds? The answer is now in our psychedelic generation, we know it's called transmutation of the senses. Psychi psychologists have, have talked about this. You've been into in museums where it plays music and you see all sorts of lights that correspond with this. But uh, there's discussion about this. You People on LSD trips have, have this phenomenon. You like my main rebound. I, I don't believe, you can try. I, I have no, I have no, I don't know what the money is, so. I can't explain. I don't know. It just seems that there are so many things that happen by that. There's no reason. And it I, that the point that the, of, the, of all these Rishonim is that it shouldn't bother you that the miracle can be explained naturally. Does it have to? Because the essence, it doesn't have to be. Correct. I, I leave it open. OK. Let me just uh, do two last things, which have a certain wow effect. Look at the in source number 12. They're going through the Midbar. And they have to cover, and before they move, they have to cover all the kelim. Let's look. Ufarsu et aron ha'idut beget kalil t'chelet melmala. Each of the, of the central kelim were covered with a blue, with a blue covering, a t'chelet covering. Vala shulchan apanim yifarsu beget t'chelet. Vlakhu beget t'chelet v'kisu et menorat ha'ma'or. So the menorah and the aron, everything is t'chelet. Vala mizbeach ha'zahab yifarsu t'chelet. ודשנו את המזבח הנחושת, ופרסו עליו בגד ארגמן. Why was the מזבח ארגמן? Everything else is blue, תחילת. Why, what's, why the, 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 the uh, מזבח החיצון נחושת? <coughs> so look at source number 13. אש תמיד תוקל על מזבח לא תכבה. Because it says that the מזבח החיצון has to have a fire on it 
all times. And look at, look at Rashi. Oh, Rashi, we don't have the quote from Rashi. Oh, yeah, we Rashi, just above that. Okay, Rashi says that what they did was they covered the flame with a cap, a psachter, a cap, a, 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 a nechoshet, and therefore it didn't burn the, the beged. Okay? Sorry. It's not right. Now it's true, wool doesn't burn, wool singes. But if you have a fire going on and you're traveling a couple of days, that garment's going to get badly singed. What's going on? The answer is, look at the, look at the structure. And you see the two chemicals that I have on the bottom left? Tchelet is indigo. And argaman is 6,6-dibromo indigo. You see, it's the same structure, but it has two bromines on it. You see that at the different corners, right and left corner? Poly bromo compounds, compounds that have bromines on them, are used in, in all pajamas that are sold. Why do they sell it? Why do they, why do they make fibers with br polybrominated? Because they're flame retardants. So the Torah said, of course. You make it out of our gaman, which is a dibromo indigo. Isn't that obvious? Well, now it is. That's pretty special. Okay, and the last thing I want to bring to your attention, it's a look at source number 14. Right? This, these fringes will be tzitzit, and you will see it. What is it? The p'til t'chelet. Right? It goes on the p'til t'chelet. Rashi on the spot wants to say it goes on the fringe, it has like a tzitzit and gematria, and then you have the, eight, the five knots, and you have. Okay, that doesn't work too well because that would be on the tzitzit, it wouldn't be on oto, which is the p'til. So, what's special about the t'chelet, the blue t'chelet, that makes you remember all the mitzvot, okay? Ladies and gentlemen, you see this picture, picture over here? The thing that defines a color is the wavelength. What's the wavelength of, of indigo, of trelet, which is indigo? Can you read it? 613. Isn't that wild? So that is the, the wavelength of trelet is 613. And therefore, that is the reason why seeing the blue reminds you of of the trilet, of the mitzvot. Now, it has a certain wow effect, but as a scientist, I have to be honest. The concept of wavelength came in probably in the 1800s, right? So it's, uh, but even if it came in very late, it's still very surprising that the wavelength turned out to be exactly 613, which is the number of the mitzvot in the Torah. Yeah, so uh, right. <laughs> You're 100% right. Wavelength is based on meters. All this is man-made. All of it is very late. But I think, look, I can't, I can't explain it to you. I have to be honest. I still think that has a certain wow effect about it. And I think it's pretty cute. Anyway, my time has run out several minutes ago. Many, I want to...